Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, lots of um, presentations about awards. And uh, often people get confused about our competition and our awards. So let me just sort of um, spell, spell out the difference. So we, every year we run an annual competition where we, we encourage people to come up with some ideas of what to do with our digital collections and data. And then we choose two of those ideas and then we work with them and they do some research or they make a shiny thing. And that's what happened this morning. Um, the awards are actually about showing us what you've already done with our digital collections and data. And for us, a project that's all about trying to get digital collections and data used, it's really important to find the examples because one of the reasons why we've got this event today is somebody in this room is going to be inspired to do something amazing. Okay, and that's what I'm hoping will come out of today. So we're going to, um, there's going to be several presentations in, in several categories. Some of them are quite um, embryonic. We're kind of, we're, we're looking at new areas in terms of the engagement that we do. Um, the project's origins are very much in, based on research, but we've been really, really surprised by the engagement we've had with artists, for example. They've done some incredible things. Um, there's also um, a commercial category this year and a teaching and learning category. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite uh, my colleagues uh, who represent those different areas in the British Library. And what they're going to do is they're going to, in some of the categories, they're going to talk about the entries that we had and then announce um, either special mentions, runners-up and winners. And the runners-up and winners will talk briefly about um, their work. So I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Alan Sudlow, who's the Head of Research Development at the British Library. And he's going to talk about our research award, and he's going to talk about projects that were submitted in this category. Um, and I'd like to invite Alan over now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd just like to actually just say before I start to congratulate Mahendra, Hannah, and the rest of the team for putting together a really brilliant symposium and a very rich program. So that's my little thank you to them. And thank you for asking me to do this. Um, uh, my name is Alan Sudlow. I'm Head of Research Development at the British Library. Um, research is really a core purpose of the library. It's why we're here. We do a lot of that through our services and online, on site. But actually, a big part of what we do around research is collaboration as well. And I think the innovative collaborations that you see through BL Labs really show how that can work. And um, I also think BL Labs has really shown how we might inform and shape future research, particularly in the area of digital scholarship. So the BL Labs Research Awards recognises outstanding and innovative work that has been carried out using our collections, digital collections and data. Uh, in particular, it shows the development of new knowledge, new research methodologies, new tools, new ways of working. Um, I believe there were seven entries this year, um, uh, but I'll only be giving a brief overview of six because I believe that one of those entries was entered into several categories. So on with the entries. Okay, so Louise Wingrove is a researcher at the University of Bristol. She used BL's digitised 19th century newspaper collections to investigate the Serio Comedienne in the Victorian era. That's a great term. Um, the project has challenged the conventional image of these female entertainers as one-dimensional, flirtatious, jingoistic performers to ones of more complex in nature, ambitious, ambiguous reflectors of gender issues, politics, and all sorts of things. And I think that's a great fit with our current exhibition in the main all. Okay. Okay, so the second um, entry, um, 19th century newspaper analytics by Paul Fife, associate professor of English, and Kianji, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, apologies if I haven't, um, candidate in electrical and computer engineering, both at uh, North Carolina State University. This project represents a really innovative partnership between researchers in English literature, electrical and computer engineering, and data analytics, and all sorts of different disciplines. Essentially, it's about how can computer vision 
and image processing be adapted for large-scale interpretation of historical illustrations. And I believe that all the URLs you're seeing up there will give you links to, uh, to more information about the, uh, the individual pro projects. So the third entry, um, GeoReferencer, the GeoReferencer project. Um, Morris Nicholson is a volunteer GeoReferencer who has worked on the BL GeoReferencer project since 2012. And apparently he is our top GeoReferencer. So I think that deserves a round of applause if nothing else. Um, and the GeoReferencer project has identified more than 50,000 maps with the, within the uh, BL's Flickr 1 million images, um, of which 20,000 plus to date have been physically located, tagged, and are available online. So I think that's a great, great move forward with that resource. Okay, Scissors and Paste uh, by Melody Beals, a lecturer in digital history at Loughborough University. Melody, Melody's project utilises the British Library Newspapers Part 1 collection, which runs from 1800 to 1900. And she's used it to explore the possibilities of mining large-scale newspaper databases to tra trace the networks of cut and paste journalistic practice of the time. If, you'll, if you're familiar with the time, you'll know that that was a specific practice at the time of re re recycling and repurposing news content. This is a really interesting project as it addresses several key questions, both in terms of historical scholarship, but also in terms of the reprinting and repurposing of news content as well. And the digital scholarship in, in, in relation to large scale content analysis and network analysis. And I believe that the, one of the outputs of this project will be a significant amount of derived data for others to use. So we are coming to, I think, is our, either our last or our second to last, which is um, Timescape Kolkata. Again, I, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Probably not. Um, um, led by Nandini Das, is a who's a professor of English and, and Literature and PI at the University of Liverpool, and um, an emeritus professor of English Literature and PI at Jadford University. The Timescape Kolkata project produced an augmented reality app, which I now understand overlays information over what you're actually seeing at the time. So essentially what the project did is it took British Library archival photographs and documentary information about historic buildings in the city of Kolkata, India, and overlay them over one another. So I think I am now on to the... Oh no, one more, I knew there was one more, which, was, uh, which is a project um, using a, a technique called network coincidence analysis and applies it to the British National Bibli Bibliographic Dataset. Uh, this analysis provides a way to delve into the data's inherent relationships and discover, and this is the important bit, discover new associations and make new comparisons. The project's already generated tools to enable researchers to explore the BNB in more detail and to visualize and understand the data to try and uh, pick out new trends and, and take their research in, hope we hope, many different exciting directions. And now I think it's drum roll time. Right, okay. So, the jury special mention goes to Maurice Nicholson. Choreography. Okay, so, um, and the runner up is Paul Five and Kian G. Oh, okay, this God, this is like the Oscars. Apparently, there is a video message. Hello, my name is Paul Five. And I am Chico. We're from North Carolina State University and are very proud to accept the runners-up award in the research category of the 2016 British Library Labs Awards. Our project is called Illustrated Image Analytics, 
We are exploring how computation and digital image processing can be used on 19th century newspapers. We're using materials from the British Library's collection of digitized historical newspapers, including the graphic, the illustrated police news, and the penny illustrated paper. All of these newspapers used a new technique called woodblock engraving, which made possible the mass printing of images before photography. They helped to create a new visual culture in the 19th century, thousands and thousands of images circulating in print. Our question is, with a similarity in nominal scale of digital image files, how might we use computer vision technologies to solve and understand historic illustrations? We have tried several different techniques, image segmentation, face detection, machine learning algorithms, and case descriptors. And we've learned that images made from engraved lines can be really hard for computers to see, even though human eyes have no trouble with them. So instead of asking computers to understand what these images represent, we've been asking them to take simpler measurements, including pixel ratio and entropy levels, and to show us patterns in the data. Using this method, we end up seeing some interesting things, including clusters of maps, illustrations at night, portrait collections, crowd scenes, and the gradual appearance of halftone images toward the end of the 19th century. Our work is still in the early stages, and you can check out our project website for more background and updates. And thanks to the British Library for their support and encouragement of digital scholarship. And I, I guess throughout the day, you see that BL Labs isn't just about the UK, it's an international collaboration, so that's great. Okay, the winner, big drum roll, is Melody Beals. Thank you very much to um, everyone who was on the, uh, the committee that judged and I really want to thank everyone who has supported me in the Scissors and Paste project. The project began about four years ago when I was a postdoc just trying to figure out what to do after my um, PhD and I got a lot of support from people who didn't necessarily understand what I was trying to do but thought it sounded really interesting and not that I was just completely mad. So hopefully um, this has really paid off in terms of their support early on. So Scissors and Pace is a project that looks at reprinting and reuse in 19th century journalism. And what that basically equates to is people stealing. In order to really run a newspaper in the 19th century, you needed a couple of things. First of all, you had to purchase or inherit or otherwise obtain a printing press, um, sometimes by auction or begging from other people who had one who didn't need one anymore, and the metal type to make your prints. You also had to subscribe to a variety of other people's newspapers. And in this respect, this was made a lot easier in the Anglophone world by governments in Britain and the United States who did not charge postal rates for sending newspapers between editors. And the other thing you needed was a sturdy pair of scissors. Because you did not have reporters or journalists for most of these newspapers, which was usually a man or maybe a man and his children working on the newspaper, you had to cut from various other articles that you thought were interesting and then reset them in your own newspaper. And this led to a lot of articles appearing again and again in newspapers. And what I sort of discovered as a historian of 19th century migration is that historians understood the concept of scissors and paste journalism. We know that there was a lot of copying going on, but we don't always follow up on that idea very well. And I noticed in lots of books and articles, they would say, this is how Edinburgh felt about it, or this is how Bristol felt about it. And I would have to say, actually, that newspaper article appeared three days earlier in an entirely different newspaper, and Bristol has nothing to do with it. And historians can't really be blamed for this. They're not going to go through every single newspaper to see if something appeared previously. And that's where Scissors and Paste comes in. So the first thing I had to do was to delve into the British Library collections. And as already been mentioned ad nauseum today, the original collections are in XML. They have been OCR'd, optical character recognition, to go from image to text. And these texts are... Um, 
interesting to say the least. Some of them are excellent, some of them are just lots of squiggly lines when you look at them after they've been OCR'd. But that's okay. Unlike a lot of the other projects, they didn't have to be perfect for what I wanted to do. So the first thing I did is I took the XML files and I used a script called XSL to move them from this lovely metadata librarian's dream to just plain text data, which is all I cared about. I then used something called CopyFind, which is a plagiarism detection software. It's basically used against students to see if they've copied any of their physics term papers at the University of Virginia. But the thing I really loved about it is that it was very, very good at fuzzy searching. And if you have a closer look at the results, the red text is what is an exact match, and the blue text is what is an okay match. And all of those OCR errors get really wiped away clean. And because I had transferred all the XML files into text files, I was able to basically run the entire database through plagiarism detection software, bit by bit in little chunks of about 200 days, and find where matches appeared over the course of the century. And if you look on the right-hand side from your perspective, I get this as an output, a list of possible matches where there is about 200 words of copied text. And I did 200 words just to get rid of most of the advertisements. Once I have this, I am able to create this Indiana Jones-style map of how news is traveling across the country as it appears. And what's really fascinating about this project so far is if you look at the little mini map of London as news travels, news is not going from London out to the provinces. Some news is, but there's also news coming into London and running around London back and forth. And once I had this idea of which type of news is moving between different parts of the country and then internationally, we can sort of understand how the hidden structures of the 19th century newspaper network worked. How do these newspapers really talk to each other? And what's particularly useful about the scissors and paste database that I was able to create is the fact that you can look at it at several levels. On the one hand, I created a very short C++ computer program that goes through these big lists and narrows them down on a couple of different factors. One being, are they in the same newspaper? Well, if they're in the same newspaper, they're probably not a reprint unless that editor is kind of absent-minded. And I did find a couple of those, but only one or two. Um, if it's more than 200 days apart, it's probably not news. News was fairly time sensitive. And if it wasn't a certain number of characters long, it was probably just a common phrase or a preamble to something that happened quite often in lots of different newspapers. Once you take all of those out, you can start to link things up ancestor to descendant. Which newspaper is most similar, letter by letter, to the one that came before it? So you can kind of get a general idea of who copied from who on a regular basis. And finally, you can do something called collation, where you take two manually transcribed versions of the text and run them through software to try to line up the various bits word by word, punctuation mark to punctuation mark. Now, as you can see here, the bottom represents just the headline of this article. It's actually about 70 screens long if you do the whole article. And the top gives you a sort of zoomed in look. And you can see different headlines for the same article appearing in different issues either British vessel plundered by the natives of the Marquesa Islands or dreadful massacre by the natives of the Marquesa Islands. Slightly different in both cases. And just a sad side note, the top one is the more accurate one. Their vessel was plundered. They, no one actually died, but that's the headline that tended to be more successful. And once you have all of these different connections, where do memes appear in different places? And also, who are the parents, who are the children of these different reprints? And how does different things change, depending on whether or not they apply house style or whether or not they actually change words, add or subtract? In the end, you end up with a reusable database of reuse. And that's the core point of the project. All of these different lists that I've created are all available up on a GitHub repository. You can visit scissorsandpaste.net and look at either pretty images of the newspaper's um, transcriptions, or you can download the raw data yourself. 
So please, next time you use a newspaper article from the British Library collection, just have a quick double check to see if it is a reprint of somewhere else, and so you don't make that same mistake in your next article. Thank you very much. Thank you.